Thank you, Thomas, and thanks really um, to all to the organizers for uh, bringing us together. I'm delighted to see um, old friends and colleagues with whom I have a, an ongoing conversation since uh, many years, but also um, to to meet and and hear um, other new uh, people, and including uh, to be in dialogue with with Edwidge, whose whose work I've been. Um, you know, drawing from and which has been an inspiration um, since several years, in particular, her her thinking on uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, um, so, as Thomas just mentioned, um, I, I co-founded a project called Forensic Oceanography, um, well, in fact, 10 years ago, um, with my colleague Lorenzo Pezzani, um, based, based at Goldsmiths in, in London. And I'm going to say um, a few more words about this in, in my presentation um, this morning. But essentially, you could say that, um, well, in what happens, the, the, in the question, what happens to um, dead migrants' bodies, uh, the, the question that Bidisha, um opened with, well, one of the things that happens um, surrounding these bodies are claims to justice, right? Claims to justice by um, the survivors of particular shipwrecks um, and claims to justice that are supported as well by different NGOs who seek through strategic litigation to contest the, the policies and practices that structurally lead to migrants' deaths in different border zones. And that's really where the work of forensic oceanography has sought to um, intervene by uh, documenting um, the policies and practices that lead to um, cases of death. And so I want to start with, simply by sharing um, uh, this video, Liquid Traces, that offers a synthesis of the Left to Die Boat case which was the first incident which we documented, um, an incident that occurred, in fact, 10 years ago. Um, in fact, you know, I was thinking uh, before I, I, I preparing this presentation for this morning. Um, well, very literally, um, the passengers left the coast of Libya 10 years ago on the 27th of March. Right now, on the 1st of April, um, 10 years ago, they had began their, their deadly drift following several interactions with state actors that, um, uh, that is documented and reconstructed in this video. So let me simply show the video. And in my presentation, I'll um, offer more context um, about this video and, and some of the methodological and ethical challenges that we faced both in relation to this case, but in relation and in relation to um, f investigations that we've conducted um, over the last 10 years. So just give me a second to share my, my screen now. Oh. Okay. Modulations of the sea's ever-moving surface immediately fold back into its immense liquid mass. What traces might death at and through the sea leave? How to reconstruct violations when the murder weapon is the water itself? What are the conditions that transform the sea into a deadly liquid? In early 2011, the turbulent movement of maritime currents spilled over onto North African land. While the historical routes that connected the Mediterranean had been disrupted by the EU's policy of closure since the end of the 80s, following the fall of Ben Ali, several thousand Tunisians seized their freedom to move. 
In response, on the 20th of February, Frontex, the European border agency, increased its presence in the area. Deploying patrol boats and aircraft to police the unruly freedom of the high seas, it constituted a mobile and deterritorialized border. In Libya, the uprising that started in Benghazi was quickly met with violent repression from the Gaddafi regime, leading to a civil war. On the 19th of March, an international coalition began a military intervention with the stated aim of preventing the loss of civilians. On the 23rd, NATO assumed command over the arms embargo and declared a maritime surveillance area. By the 24th, 38 warships were in operation off the Libyan coast. We are main uh, interest in uh, the control all the contacts inbound and westbound from uh, Libyan uh, coasts. In addition to its warships and maritime patrol aircrafts, NATO relied on a complex assemblage of remote sensing technologies so as to detect threats hidden within maritime traffic. These included AIS vessel tracking systems, which emit a signal to coastal radar stations with information as to the identity, speed, and position of large commercial vessels. While the AIS coverage was limited off the Libyan coast, NATO also relied on synthetic aperture radar imagery, which emits radar signals from satellites snapping the surface of the Earth according to their orbit. The returns of large vessels appear as bright pixels on the sea's dark surface. Through such technologies, the sea's liquid waves are supplemented by a constantly pulsating sea of electromagnetic waves. As the combats intensified, so did population movements. While most people had fled by land to neighboring countries, at the end of March, some attempted to cross the sea, often with the complicity of pro qaddafi soldiers who were using migrants as a weapon of war. These conditions led to a record number of deaths at sea, which occurred under the patchy vision of NATO's digital eyes. In the early hours of the 27th of March, 72 people embarked on a 10-meter-long rubber boat. Before departing, the Libyan military handed them a GPS and a satellite phone. At first, the overcrowded boat moved swiftly across the calm sea. At 1455, the passengers noticed an aircraft flying high above them. It was a French patrol aircraft, which, as an investigation by the Council of Europe has subsequently determined, transmitted a photograph and the boat's coordinates to the Italian Coast Guard headquarters in Rome. The passengers continued navigating in the direction of Lampedusa, but as the end of the day neared, Having covered only half the distance and with little fuel left, they decided to call for help. They phoned an Eritrean priest based in the Vatican, whose number has circulated widely across the East African diaspora. Father Zerai in turn transferred the message to the Italian Coast Guard, who determined the vessel's location through the satellite phone provider based in Abu Dhabi. A point within a patchwork of often overlapping and conflicting maritime jurisdictions, the boat was positioned outside of Italy and Malta's search and rescue zones, within which they are responsible to coordinate rescue. The Italian Coast Guard did not intervene, neither did they ensure themselves that any other actor would, but they did alert their Maltese counterparts and NATO HQ in Naples. They further sent out a signal informing all vessels in the Sicily Channel of the boat's distress and position. The signal would be emitted again every four hours for the next 10 days. The boat was, however, located within NATO's maritime surveillance area, and several military vessels are confirmed to have been located in vicinity. 
While NATO has been pressured to admit that it did pass on the signal to all units under its command, its standard practice regarding migrants in distress at the time was one of minimal assistance. Through it, NATO sought to enable migrants to advance just far enough for Italy or Malta to become responsible for rescuing them. This is what never happened for the passengers of the Left to Die boat. Shortly after the call to Father Zerai, a helicopter hovered over the passengers. Abukurke Kebato recalls the encounter. One helicopter they come to us, military helicopter. How far was? I mean, very close to you? Very close. He come to us down. Very close. He come to us down. And we show them uh, baby. And we show them we finish the uh, oil. We tell them, please help us. Very, very close. He come us down. I think he take out even our picture. I look, he take like, photo. The helicopter, he come back. He look us. He go. Could you see some flag, Italy or US or Canada? No, no. I read it, I read it on helicopter, army. It was written in English? English, in English, yeah, army. The military helicopter left. While it remains unidentified to this day, the description of the helicopter's behavior is consistent with NATO's protocols for vessel identification. And we were able to confirm the presence of helicopters bearing army on their side through plain spotter's photographs. Believing rescue was now on its way, the driver threw overboard the satellite phone, fearing it might be used to incriminate him as a smuggler. The second and last GPS position registered by the satellite phone provider thus corresponds in all likelihood to the location of the first helicopter encounter. By the time the helicopter left, it was dark. Waiting for rescue, the migrants remain in place several hours. Around midnight, some of the passengers started to get worried and told the driver, we cannot wait anymore, let's go. Once they resumed movement, the passengers saw fishermen boats nearby and tried to approach them. Fishermen, however, who are present in great number in the Sicily Channel, have been repeatedly accused of facilitating illegal migration when they rescued migrants at sea, and have thus become increasingly reluctant to do so. When the fishermen saw the migrants' boat approaching, they drew in their nets and sailed away swiftly, almost making the small migrants' vessel capsize. As the fishermen faded into the night, what appeared to be the same helicopter hovered over the migrants' boat once again. This time, the military on board lowered down eight bottles of water and small packets of biscuits before abandoning them. The migrants encountered one more Tunisian fishing boat. Four hours, four hours, the fishermen said in Arabic, pointing in the direction of Lampedusa. In the dark, the migrants continued their route with all possible speed, knowing they were running out of fuel. At daybreak, the motor stopped. Another signal had been sent out in the early morning, but to no avail. None of the commercial vessels accounted for by AIS data diverted its course to abide by its duty to rescue passengers in distress. Neither did the large vessels which appear as bright pixels in the satellite images we have acquired, several of which must be military. The closest vessels appearing in the image from the 29th of March were only 40 kilometers away and could have reached the migrant's boat in less than two hours. While these remote sensing technologies are usually used for surveillance, they are here repurposed as evidence of guilt. Abandoned to the winds and currents, they became prisoners of their frail boat, chained to the sea's open expanse. The sea became an unwilling killer, and yet it is also a witness of the events, which, interrogated for us by an oceanographer, has revealed the drifting boat's trajectory. According to the reconstructed trajectory, the migrants' boat did briefly enter the Maltese search and rescue zone, 
but was soon pushed back out of it by southeast winds and currents that would continue for the next 14 days. For several days, the passengers drifted in bad weather. Left without food or water, the migrants began drinking seawater as well as their own urine. After two to three days, they started dying one by one. During the night, Dan Haile Gebre remembers seeing the lights of other big boats in the distance. In the attempt to come closer to these vessels, four people started paddling with their bare hands but the ships continued their swift course. The sea is an arrhythmic space of high archaized mobility, speedy and secure for certain goods and privileged passengers, slow and deadly for the unwanted. After five to six days of drift, half the passengers had passed away. It is then, in a dead calm sea, that the migrants' vessel encountered a military ship. This one is a part of it, okay? Mm -hmm. The ship was there, okay? The ship, okay? You mean this distance? No, it's very long distance, uh, okay? almost 700 meters, something. Mm -hmm. But they are watching that, okay? So, they made a rotation. Around your... Yeah, around that, okay? At the third one, they come like this. Very close. Yeah, very close, around 10 meters or 9 meters. We cannot close to them because it's too much, the water is not good. Sure. We are just watching them, people is dying, okay? Uh, and also as children, some people are drinking water, crying, something like that. So they are asking them for help, but they didn't get us anything, only taking pictures. Despite witnessing the passengers suffering, the military vessel left without providing them with any assistance. In so doing, it murdered them without touching their bodies. The identity of the ship remains undisclosed to this day. There were, however, several frigates deployed at the time that resembled the two-step structure forever imprinted on Dan Haile Gebre's memory. The presence of several vessels in the area was again confirmed by satellite imagery analysis. What is the identity of all these ships? Which of these return might, for instance, correspond to the Spanish Mendez Nunes and the Belgium Narcisse, both confirmed to have transited through this area during these days? After the military ship left, the passengers lost all hope. As they continued their deadly drift, they grew closer to the Libyan coast. Then Haile Gebre recalls seeing buildings at night. While the driver believed this was Malta, some Nigerians on the boat said, no, these are the hotels built by Gaddafi in Tripoli. By this time, most of the remaining passengers had lost consciousness. On the 10th of April, the boat finally washed ashore in Zlitan, with 11 people alive. One woman died on the beach, and another man in prison after they were locked up by the Libyan military. The nine survivors would be released five days later. For 14 days, the passengers had slowly drifted in the most surveyed waters on Earth. Despite repeated contacts, 63 passengers were killed by the reluctance of all actors to rescue them. Yet nine people did survive to tell their story. By assembling their testimonies with the digital traces left by the events, we were able to map the trajectory of their boat across the liquid geography of the sea. Every point and every line drawn on this map seeks to inscribe responsibility in a sea of impunity. 
On the basis of our report and several other investigations, a coalition of NGOs has filed legal cases against the states participating in the military operations in Libya. While our reconstruction of the events has not been contested, the crime of non-assistance has so far remained invisible to the law. 1,500 other deaths were documented in 2011 amongst those fleeing Libya across the sea. 14,000 deaths have been documented at the maritime borders of the EU over the last 20 years. Many more remain silent in the sea's depths, killed by a selective and militarized mobility regime which has turned a perpetual flow of currents into a deadly weapon. Well, it's always challenging to pick up a conversation um, after this, uh, the screening of this video. Um, here we are on a, on a beautiful morning, it seems, in where most of us are, when 10 years ago, um, 72 passengers were um, being abandoned to drift to a slow death. And in fact, not only um, Somehow do we need to position ourselves in relation to uh, the horrific reality of past deaths, but in relation to the ongoing and continuous reality um, of border violence. In fact, um, for those of you who maybe follow the, the alarm phones work, the Watch the Med alarm phone, which um, I, I contributed to found as well. Um, last night, the Watch the Med alarm phone was um, called by um, 80 people on a boat, a rubber boat, who had fled uh, Libya. They said, um, like the passengers of the Lesta Die boat case 10 years ago, they said they have problems with their engine and are in urgent need uh, of rescue. The alarm phone um, team on shift last night called repeatedly the armed forces of Malta, which have until this morning um, refused to answer the phone, right? So I, I know this is a, a tough way to, to start the, the morning, but I think we, we cannot um, not ask ourselves, how do we respond as, as researchers to the past and ongoing reality of um, border violence? Now, what, I, what I'd like to do now after this uh, video is to um, give a bit more context to how um, the Forensic Oceanography Project emerged and some of the methodological, theoretical, and ethical challenges that we've had to um, face um, over, over the years. So let me share my screen again. For some reason, I, I can't see um, the other participants in the video, but okay, I, I guess that's... So, clearly the Mediterranean is only um, one of the areas that crystallizes 
um, a very intense mobility conflict between um, the movements, the desires of migrants from the global south and um, the restrictive policies of uh, states of the global, the global north. You see, of course, that there are um, fault lines of these mobility conflicts across different areas in the Mediterranean, but also across the US-Mexico US border between Australia and Southeast Asia. But also you can see them mapped here by our friend and colleague, Filip Rekacevic. Um, around South Africa, for example, or um, around the Arabian uh, Peninsula. The Mediterranean, however, um, has been one of the, really the epicenter of the, the landscape of death that this, these mobility conflicts have structurally um, generated. And organizations like United Against Racism have meticulously counted, documented each case of reported death over um, the last 30 years and established a list of more than 40,000 recorded deaths. Of course, many more um, people have died without leaving any other trace than the haunting absence for, um, that they leave for their families. Organizations such as Migrorop have um, produced maps and denounced these deaths as the structural outcome of um, the European border regime. But until 2011, it was very, very challenging for civil society to um, go beyond denouncing these deaths, to seek to demand accountability um, for them. And this, um, they, in this, they faced a number of issues. One issue is the very particular modality of border deaths that um, operates at the maritime frontier. If you look at United's list of death, you will see that the majority of more than 40,000 deaths who have died at the maritime borders of Europe have died not as a result of border guards shooting on them, although that does of course happen, but rather as a result of drowning. So this is a form of indirect days, death, a form of mediated death, um, which operates by European states and their, their southern counterparts, creating um, dangerous conditions of border crossings for migrants. And as we've seen, refraining um, from assisting them when they encounter situations of, of distress. This is a form then of what we've called a form of liquid violence, which however has um, different modalities. It does not always operate in, in the same way. And part of our work has been to try and uh, register and contest these shifting modalities of uh, liquid violence that turn the sea itself into a lethal um, environment for migrants. Another issue, and this is one of the issues I'd like to foreground this morning, might be framed as um, an aesthetic challenge. Aesthetic, not in the sense of, um, you know, beauty or uh, ugliness, but rather in the Rancierian sense of that which presents itself to our senses. The border regime creates also a particular aesthetic regime, i.e conditions of invisibility of migrants crossings and border violence, but also of inaudibility. It's in that sense that I prefer the term of aesthetics, which is broader and more encompassing than, for example, the politics of um, visibility, even though the, the dimension of visibility is very uh, important. And you can, you can see this, um, aesthetic regime at work, for example, in this um, image taken by the Italian border police of a boat crossing the sea at night, uh, trying to migrate undetected because they have been illegalized by European um, migration policies. Um, migrants thus cross the, the sea at night and they try to um, migrate literally under the radar without being detected by 
border guards that might um, interrupt their border crossings. Instead, state actors seek to shed light on their unauthorized mobility, for example, by using um, technologies such as these thermal cameras. At the same time, um, as, you, as you see from the Left to Die Boat case, um, there is a much more ambivalent um, aesthetic politics, if you will, at work here, where when migrants do encounter situations of distress, they may do everything they possibly can to be seen and heard by state actors as well, while states instead may seek to not hear or turn a blind eye on um, their distress and refrain from averting their, their, their tragic fate. We see this ambivalence as well with um, in the politics of images, where um, if any of you tries to Google today migration, boat, Mediterranean, you'll see an avalanche of boats of intercepted migrants um, appear, which reproduce what Nicolas de, de Genova has referred to as the border spectacle through which um, the, 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 the securitized um, policies surrounding migration are reproduced and, and naturalized, while at the same time, images of border violence are instead kept in uh, the shadows. So these aesthetic conditions made it very, very challenging to um, document precisely uh, the, the pr pr spe specific incidents of border violence at sea and border death, and made it very difficult for survivors and civil society to demand accountability and try to interrupt the politics of impunity, which allows um, border violence to be um, per perpetuated. Our own work began in 2011, as you saw in uh, this video, in the context when the Mediterranean frontier was being reopened. And um, it really began in response to a press statement by a small French NGO that has specialized since several years in strategic litigation, the GISTI. And the GISTI formulated the argument in June 2011 when there were already echoes of the way um, the, Lib uh, the NATO forces deployed off the coast of Libya were failing and assisting migrants. The GISTI formulated the argument that um, because of the unprecedented degree of surveillance deployed off the Libyan coast, these actors could not not know about their uh, distress and their fate. And by failing and assisting them, they were guilty of the crime of non-assistance. The truth is in fact that the GST had no idea how about, you know, how they would um, file legal complaints against NATO, the EU, and all states taking part in the, the coalition against Libya, as they announced in this press statement. But to a certain extent, this press statement created its own reality. And it's in response to this press statement that we formed forensic oceanography, um, asking ourselves if we might um, support this demand for accountability with the new horizon of practices of documentation that was emerging within the broader forensic architecture project to which forensic oceanography is um, affiliated. Quickly, the coalitions around that the GST brought together started to focus on the left to die boat case. And we had only one single photographic image to work with, this image, which had been taken by a French military aircraft. And so to try and corroborate the, the testimonies of um, the, the passengers. I think we really tried to operate two um, distinct methodological moves. The first was really asking ourselves, well, what, have, what traces have this series of events left? How might we seize upon the remote sensing apparatus deployed by states to detect acts of unauthorized border crossing and uh, use it against the grain to um, register these practices of border violence instead. And the second methodological move was 
um, how can we spatialize these traces, these digital traces, so as to locate these events within the political geography of the maritime frontier. As you see in the video, but also here in this map, um, the sea is far from being um, a space, an outlaw space that allows, lies outli outside, excuse me, of state power and jurisdictions. Rather, it's a patchwork of crisscrossing jurisdictions. Um, what we've called using the, the term proposed by Saskia Sassen, um, where, where we have at work a form of unbundled sovereignty. And states use this particular political geography to selectively expand their, their rights, for example, to intercept migrants on the high seas, or on, on the contrary, to retract from their responsibilities, for example, retracting from their responsibility to coordinate and operate um, rescue. And in this way, using these methodologies, we carefully piece together the different elements of evidence that could be brought together to corroborate the testimonies of the nine survivors in the Left to Die Boat case, using drift models, as you've seen, satellite imagery, and reconstructed carefully the chain of events. This did raise also at the time for us ethical challenges. How can we use um, remote sensing and mapping techniques without, um, how should I say, erasing the subjective experience of the passengers? This is a critique that has been often formulate with, formulated within critical GIS studies and which we took very seriously. And this is one of the reasons why producing um, the video liquid traces that you just saw was very important for us. What we try to do in a way in this video is to um, bring together, if you will, the view from above, um, enabling this cartographic uh, and highly technical reconstruction of the events and the view from the boat, if you will, i.e. Uh, the embodied experience of um, the migrants on board this drifting boat. Our reconstruction was the basis for um, several cases against Euro European states taking part in the coalition um, against Libya, cases that are still in fact ongoing to this date, 10 years after the fact. In fact, what has happened is really that uh, states have, no, no, no actor has in fact uh, contested fundamentally our reconstruction of, of events and those, the parallel investigations, for example, by the Council of Europe. But um, they have argued that their assets were not the closest to um, the drifting boat without, have, however, justifying um, why they failed to bring themselves to uh, uh, avert the fate of the drifting passengers and without either um, offering evidence that would allow to identify the closest vessels and aircrafts that um, the passengers directly encountered in their um, trajectory. So despite our work that sought to make visible this act of border violence, so far uh, this violence has remained, if you will, invisible to the law and the impunity for this incident prevails. Um, the, the, the different teams of lawyers and, uh, who, which have filed the complaints in front of their respective uh, countries are at present seeking to exhaust um, their domestic uh, courts and, and their, their, their means, um, uh, their means of, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the legal processes within those domestic courts so as to be able to file a complaint in front of the European Court of human rights. Um, Thomas, Bidisha, Judith, might you just tell me how I'm doing for time and how much time I still have left in this uh, presentation? I'm sorry, I've slightly lost track. Yeah, uh, maybe three minutes, would, be, would that be okay for you? So then I'll try to be um, very, very brief. I've, I've tried to share with you um, the Left to Die Boat case, which um, I think illustrates some of the methodologies and challenges that we've um, faced. But of course, each the, the, 
the partition of the sensible operating at the Mediterranean frontier is ever shifting. And each incident um, demands careful, careful positioning. Um, if you will, the rearticulation and repositioning of what we've called a disobedient gaze. This is a concept that we've forged somehow to guide our own practice. Um, and by, by which we understand that we seek to um, reveal what states seek to, con to conceal, but not reveal what they do seek to, to reveal. And again, this disobedient gaze demands to be rearticulated, repositioned each time in relation to shifting aesthetic conditions and shifting forms and modalities of border violence. Um, I, I can only go very, very briefly um, through some of the work that we've done, for example, concerning the, the ending of the Mare Nostrum operation, in which we really had um, a veritable policy of non-assistance operating at the scale of the Mediterranean itself, and which led to um, a staggering increase in the death um, of migrants. We've reconstructed this policy shift in our report, Death by Rescue. But what I wanted to try and finish with was um, one of the last cases that we've focused on, and which brings to the fore um, um, uh, another set of ethical um, challenges. And this is the Sea Watch versus Libyan Coast Guard case. Now, you know that since 2016, 2017, the EU and Italy have deployed um, what we've called um, a mar the Mare Clausum policy, which involves criminalizing rescue NGOs and uh, outsourcing border control to the Libyan um, Coast Guard. And in response to this um, twin two-pronged policy, if you will, Sea-Watch um, radicalized its visual politics, equipping its ship with um, multiple constantly recording cameras, its crew as well, um, installing audio recording devices to record the communication with uh, Italian, Maltese, and Libyan Coast Guard. And with this, um, with, in this way, it turned its ship into um, a constantly recording audiovisual um, device. And in this way, it was able to document with an unprecedented degree of precision one incident of partly failed interception by the Libyan Coast Guard, in which half the passengers were rescued by uh, the Sea Watch vessel, but half of them were also intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard and brought back to Libya, where several of them were subjected to torture. And this footage was the basis for forensic oceanography and forensic uh, architecture to really reconstruct this incident in um, a minute by minute detail, relying no longer, say, on one single image as we had in, in the, the Left to Die Boat case, but rather really on hours of audiovisual material that's allowed to document with great precision this incident and um, support demands for accountability by uh, several NGOs, GLAN and ASG in, in particular, um, who supported the survivors in filing a case against Italy in front of the European Court of Human Rights, against Italy and the EU's policy of refoulement by proxy, right? The use of the Libyan Coast Guard to um, push back migrants to Libya um, in the attempt by Italy and the EU not to be made responsible for their fate um, it, by not um, coming into direct physical contact with um, their bodies. Now, as important as this footage was um, in enabling this reconstruction and this demand for accountability, it also raised um, challenging questions. If um, in the Left to Die Boat case, we reconstructed this um, incident from the scale of the Mediterranean, right? At the scale, uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a distance. Here, this footage brings us in very close and in fact, disturbing proximity to um, migrants struggling for their lives. In fact, uh, the video footage records um, 
the drowning of two people to whom, of course, we will never be able to ask for the consent to use this um, footage. The footage also risks um, reproducing some of the racialized tropes of uh, racialized subjects um, struggling for their lives while um, the white saviors relatively calmly um, seek to rescue them. So I simply wanted to um, share with you this other um, case at the, the, the other end of the trajectory of investigations that we've um, produced and to try and exemplify um, the very different ethical questions that each investigation brings um, to the fore. To try and respond to these questions, um, we, for example, conducted uh, detailed interviews with the survivors in which um, they look back at the footage that was produced, somehow resubjectifying these images that were produced in an automated way without the migrants being um, involved, if you will, in their um, production. So simply to, to conclude now in, um, one, in, in just a few seconds, what I've tried to, to share with you here is fundamentally a very simple argument that um, contesting the, the violence of borders also demands that we contest the boundaries of what can be seen and heard at the maritime borders, but certainly also in other border areas. But in doing this, we need to constantly um, analyze shifting modalities of border violence and shifting conditions of visibility and invisibility, of audibility and inaudibility, and reposition ourselves carefully in, in, re in relation to this complex and ambivalent field. And also acknowledge that um, we will enter a field of ambivalence in which um, revealing and uh, can be at once extremely important um, towards demand for accountability, but always also uh, is at risks of reproducing other forms of symbolic violence. And we need to be, how should I say, attuned and reflective to these ethical questions and, and ambivalences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to our wonderful organizers for producing such an incredible lineup of workshops and then of speakers within those workshops. And thank you to Shell, obviously, for this incredibly stimulating talk, this really fascinating film. I have to say that I had read many accounts and analyses of it over the years, but this was my first screening. So thank you very much for bringing this to us. I think that it remains, for me and for many of us, really an exemplary, um, a perfect example of the kind of, of deep and demanding intellectual and forensic work that you've been doing for many years, and that remains such a such an inspiration. So thank you very much for all this. Um, I'll start with the very same question that has been animating us so far, um, the question of what happens to the submerged bodies of migrants who perish during their ill-fated maritime journey to Europe, to migrant bodies excluded from the usual social practices surrounding death and bereavement, for instance, the repatriation of bodies to the home country for a funeral, or the many rituals surrounding burial in a clearly circumscribed grave. So my approach actually dips under the surface and looks at um, what happens beneath, um, beneath the surface in the depth of the sea in order to try and think the bodies of dry, drowned migrants um, anonymized left to die at sea, those that cannot even claim, in fact, the fate of entombment in a maritime cemetery. In fact, I will argue that the very nature of water and its endless planetary circulation functions as a principle of dispersal and virtualization. Once deceased, these bodies are left to decompose in the elements, dissolved through the corrosive effect of seawater, dispersed and amalgamated into the marine environment, disappear from view and bereft of proper memorialization. So I therefore ask the question, once the usual paradigms surrounding death are made impossible, how then are we to think those migrant deaths and the dynamic of invisibility that they generate? How are we to think the politics of life and death that hinge on this very specific form of social and physical death, that is the drowning at sea? How even to rethink our own relation to our political democratic structures and the political and ethical imperative of hospitality 
enshrined in international legal documents, such as the Geneva Convention of 1951, in light of this blatant disavowal of its most fundamental principles, or further, how even to rethink our very relationship to nature or man's supposed ownership of the earth. So I will, um, these are very far reaching questions that I will touch on later in the talk. Um, but for now, I would like to get us started on this idea of dissolution by looking at two citations that each in its own way sheds light on the dissolutive ontologies that I will be trying to theorize today. And I will be sharing my screen. So bear with me for just a minute. Let me see. It's been acting up a bit. Okay, can you see it? Yes, all right, wonderful. So let's start with the first citation then. I'm trying to move this out of the way. Okay. A world center and not a self centered view of viewing, such that the self becomes part of that which is seen, not a sovereign transcendent. To thus see ourselves in the midst of the world is to enter into ourselves as image, to exchange standing above the fray, the God position, for some quite other position that is not really a position at all, but something more like swimming, more like nomads adrift in the sea, mother of all metaphor, the sea I call the bodily unconscious. And then a second um, citation here from Donna Haraway's Tentacular Thinking, we, meaning humans, are humus, not homo, not anthropos. We are compost, not post-human. So in order to delve into the specifics of this dissolutive model, we need to turn first to the very medium, allowing this amalgamation between the human and more than human to take place. The medium, which is also the bridge to the other more metaphorical conceptualizations I was evoking earlier. And I'm here talking about the element of seawater. First, to be understood as an analytical category in a way conducive to reflections on men's place in the world that are parsed either through political or ecocritical paradigms that generate lines of inquiry into the complex polysemic nature of water as a social construct but also, and I would argue more importantly, seawater as an elemental substance that is not simply in terms of the ocean as surface, volume, space, and geography, the 361 million square kilometers of the hydrosphere as a planetary interconnected system of oceanic water, but rather seawater as liquid voluminous matter, hydromatter, taken at the molecular level infiltrating, permeating, and ultimately corroding the various bodies steeped in its volume. I also want to gesture in passing to a third conception of seawater beyond all this, the notion of seawater as vibrant matter, in Jane Bennett's haunting words, alive with movement and with a certain power of expression, a preposition that gestures towards seawater's sentient agency to its power not only to alter the shape of social and spatial processes, but also to connect intimately with animated life forms. My focus therefore brings an ecocritical focus to bear on a materialist analysis of bodies of water, here at the Mediterranean Sea, but also of bodies in water in a way that implicates the human and the geophysical in a bilateral process of mutual corrosion and eventually of amalgamation. So let us turn for a minute to material feminist criticism and its understanding of the intricate relationship between bodies and their environment. And I will start here with Stacey Alemo's concept of transcorporeality that she develops in her book Exposed, in which she defines as a conception of the human as that which is always generated through and entangled in differing scales in source of biological, technological, economic, social, political, and other systems. Transcorporeality, she continues, is a new materialist and posthumanist sense of the human as substantially and perpetually interconnected with the flows of substances and the agencies of environments. The always already aquatic origin of human bodies, which Alemo directly postulates here, finds broad resonance in the work of Astrid Niemannis, um, especially in their milestone book, Bodies of Water, from which I'm quoting here, our bodies of water are, ne are neither stagnant nor separate nor zipped up in some kind of impermeable sack of skin. These bodies are rather deeply implicated in the intricate movements of water that create and sustain life on our planet. Niemann is thus theoretically integrates the human body 
which in its adult form is made up of 60% of water, with the planetary water cycle, which she terms the hydrocommons. She identifies a kinship between biotic and non-biotic bodies, between the biological and the geophysical, citing as examples of this mutual, um, of this mutual entanglement, the disposal of urine through wastewater, the evaporation of sweat into the humid air, um, or the juice of a piece of fruit that will be digested and then become part of the bodily water content. This is not to forsake our inescapable humanness, Neimanis tells us, but to suggest instead that the human is always also more than human. Our wateriness verifies this both materially and conceptually. Water then is what interpermeates and connects beings. As such, it might teach us something about an expanded understanding of the ontological. So building on a lamos transcorporeality and Imani's hydrocommons, the line of inquiry that I'm proposing here wants to spotlight a model of what I call a transmaterial ontology articulated around the corrosive power of seawater through which organic and inorganic matters, in this argument, the disintegrating, disintegrating submerged bodies of shipwrecked migrants in the Mediterranean and their ecologically ravaged more than human deep sea environment commingle. Furthering Olemos claim that the human is something that has become sedimented in the geology of the planet means teasing out the full scope of what this material sedimentation might involve in light of the dual dynamic of bodily exposure and bodily erasure triggered by the drowning. It means working at an angle to surface level readings of the ocean, delving below the surface into oceanic depths to complicate theorization of the ocean as metaphor. The seawater criticism that I engage in, therefore, redirects epistemological engagements from the sphere of knowledge to the sphere of experience, as the sea becomes a space of intimate familiarity, not simply one to reflect on, but one where one comes to live or here comes to die. Engaging the materiality of water, revealing the H2O beneath the seam ultimately means attending to the bare materiality of entities submerged in it to their unbearable mutability. It is opening ourselves to what David Ferrier has dubbed a newly poignant sense that our present is in fact accompanied by deep pasts and deep futures. Theories of the Anthropocene have gone a long way toward amending conception of the environment as a remote backdrop to human actions. Setting into relief the catastrophic impact of human activity onto the environment, they postulate a material inscription of the human into the geological texture of the earth. Humans are embedded in, exposed to, and even composed of the very stuff of a rapidly transforming material world. They are entangled in a complex web of relations to the world of objects in which they are situated. Such a conception runs against the grain of what Michael Tosik in the epigraph to this talk um, that we looked at as termed the God position, the position occupied by the autotelic, hyperbolic, and ultimately ecocidal Cartesian subject of Western modernity. Focusing on the transmaterial ontologies that I propose today, in contrast, boils down to acknowledging the vast disparity of power that the anthropos category itself encompasses. The contrasting embodiments of the human condition across gender, race, class, and other measures of difference and exploitation as well as the various degrees of responsibility in the sustainment of rapacious disaster capitalism. Predicating humanity on a Cartesian inspired concept of rationality, one that discriminates between the res cogitans, the thinking entity and the res extensa, the unthinking matter upon which the former exerts its thinking ability comes to an apparatic end when confronted with the existence of a class of humans considered to form an infrahumanity devoid of agency. The subaltern in postcolonial theory, the slave in biopolitical thought, or the drowned, mig drowned migrants at the bottom of the Mediterranean abyss, all of these figures um, incarnate an objective position that scrambles the divide between subjectivity and objectivity around which the notion of personhood is knotted. Against the deceit of unified centered subjecthood, the becoming residual of submerged migrant bodies ushers us into the realm of objectification. So does the slave odiously sacrifice on the altar of biopolitical dominance. In Ashin Bembe's reverberating words in Necropolitics, the slave condition results from a triple loss, loss of a home, loss of rights over his or her body and loss of political status. 
This triple loss is identical with absolute domination, natal alienation, and social death, expulsion from humanity altogether. All partake in the category that the order of capitalist modernity has designated as waste to borrow Zygmunt, um, Zygmunt Bauman's startling epithet, a classification that includes both human and more than human life. The hegemonic space-time of transatlantic modernity unfurls over drowned enslaved bodies. Today, the new migratory middle passage resurrects excruciating dynamics of submersion where sacrificial bodies are eliminated in the name of ideology, profitability, and industrialization during the slave trade, slave trade or fortress Europe today. Considering the sea as surface remains the incontrovertible privilege of those who can afford to metaphorically lose themselves in this reflective mirror. For subalterns, the deceiving flatness of the sea is always understood to harbor complex and perilous depth. Beneath the sea's plane of eminence lies another submarine horizon, the seabed dotted with the bodies of those who could not escape its voracious waters, those who remain in eternal stasis, stuck in, in space, but out of teleological time. I argue that it is the addition of depth to the consideration of vastness that recasts the oceanic as seawater. Surface level views of the pelagic emphasize connections and borderings, walls and surveillance. They reflect the temporalities and mind frames of empire capitalism and colonialist intentionality. The modernist sea narrative thus highlights an interconnected global world system an aqua nullius dedicated to mediating the deployment and reinforcement of Western modernity. The physical mutability of seawater as substance has crystallized endless metaphors, current flow fluidity to evoke globalization, formlessness and liquidity or relational models of identity at cross purposes with the racialized logic of empire. In turn, depth launches a foray into considerations of volume substance, seabed, degradation, and deep time incorporation into geophysical cycles. As Steinberg and Peters have argued in their reflections on wet epistemologies, the distinctive assemblage of death and perpetual mobility makes surveillance and other projects of ocean domestication untenable. The liquidity of the sea, they write, complicates control. Once the focus shifts from horizontal plane to three-dimensional volume, seawater immersion is indispensable to the acquisition of knowledge. Thinking through seawater as substance rather than metaphor, therefore entails multiple acts of denaturalization. Um, being immersed amounts to losing one's strict emplacement, to doing away with the certainties of terrestrial ontologies. Boundedness, a coherent sense of self, localized form, forms of knowledge, all such, such structuring principles tend to be washed away in the heaping tides of seawater. This dissentry move privileges sensory effective engagements. This haptic experience of the sea stretches the porous boundaries of subjecthood. The dissolutive properties of immersed bodies leaking into the surrounding amniotic substance point to a fundamental wateriness of beings. They query the very concept of human, non-human agon and rescript embodiment as interpenetration and amalgamation with a more than human aqueous other. In this body-centered perspective, humanness in the world is mediated through water as a connecting agent much in the vein of indigenous representations of the ocean as a vector of intimacy and contact between people or between people and the ocean itself, rather than a plane of separation. Water here functions as a viscous for altering substance, yet it can also distill lethality, physical disintegration. Fusing the body and the ocean, it acts as a disaggregating interface, in the words of Deborah Bird Rose, uniting the two in ever more ontological convergent intimacy. Bringing the focus on the deep time of the Anthropocene, Franklin Ginn comments that an encounter which can be enchanting, violent, or haunting is an event where self-contained preformed entities meet. Rather, encounters are an indeterminate moment of contamination when beings and things are brought together in interwoven rhythms. In this contamination, objected human life and wooden ecosystems coalesce into an amalgamated transmatter, the organic non organic residual compound born um, of the process of seawater degradation, which integrates the order of the human into deep geological time. 
So I would like to conclude this first moment of my reflection by taking a closer look at one literary representation of such dissolutive dynamics. And for that, I will turn to Moroccan novelist Yusuf Amin and Alami's novel, Les Clandestins, or Sea Drinkers, in its English translation. The novel partakes of a rich, growing plurilingual corpus of literature concerned with clandestine migration produced on all the shores of the Mediterranean since the 1990s, what Akim de Rizak has called illiterature. What makes this novel unique in its own way is its deliberate focus on the submarine ontology of deterioration that leaves its mark on the decomposed bodies of the migrants washing up on the diegetic beach. And I will cite here a uh, few passages from the novel, um, wounded bodies, mutilated limbs, corroded faces, flayed hands, broken lips. They will no longer hear the sound of waves. Excluded from any form of transcendent metaphysical meditations, the corroded bodies of the dead are incontrovertibly relegated to the realm of the geophysical. Here, the sea turned watery grave. The dis disintegration evidences the dispersal enacted by oceanic waters when bodies undergo the most extreme form of unmediated submersion. The fragmented description, which emphasizes the lack of physical integrity, delineates the very contours of the body's disfigurements. The breaks, the cuts, the missing tissue, El Alami, for instance, mentions their eyes eaten out, all speak to the disturbing dissolution of bodily matter into the sea to an inescapable absorption into the brewing water compound. Organic molecules scattered across the ocean by the ever reforming currents of the sea, churning alluvium, fertile sediment, feeding the deep time memorialization of the tragic loss of life under biopolitical bio violence, but also in a more disquieting move, the marine food chain. The remains, but the cyclical currents forced back to the surface undergo emerging with other forms of sea life, vegetal, mineral, creating hybrid assemblages where the human and the more than human interweave. Feet snagged in seaweed, a head of long hair coated in sand. In some cases, hybrid human animal muscle species life forms emerge, a right arm buried in the sand like a shattered wing, or later, a strange kettle of fish, fish so big they might have been human. God forbid, they look human. Dear God, like people, they are people. What is interesting here is how El Alami's anamorphic visions point out seawater's ability to blur the line between the organic and the inorganic, paving the way for the transmaterial ontologies that I have discussed to emerge and redefine the human in relation to the aqueous. So critically processing seawater as corrosive substance requires attending to its multiple regimes of signification at the crossroad of political thoughts, social regulation, capitalism, and a deep time ecocritical perspective. It also mandates ethically attending to our non-human co-constitutive others to make ourselves vulnerable to its otherness. Thinking from the perspective of seawater means remaking the human into amorphous transmatter humus, to go back to Haraway's introductory quote, making room for the consideration of unexpected hybrid assemblages that lay bare other definitions of the human beyond the dictum of exceptionalism and the destructive acts perpetrated in its name. It demands crafting, in other words, new forms of ethical thought and practice. So in the last couple of minutes that I have, four minutes that I have left, I would like now to turn, return, in fact, to the biopolitical resonance of this dissolutive transmatter ontologies. And to do so, I'd like to um, return again to this concept with which we have started this session, the concept of the border, or more precisely here, the concept of, and I will give it in French, the corps frontière, the border body, or even perhaps the body border, which Achille Membe's very recent and yet untranslated essay, Brutalisme, has defined as those of hommes déchets qui n'ont pas de valeur ajoutée pour le capitalisme, so human waste that is of no added value for capitalism. So let us for a moment probe the enmeshment of this necropolitical violence performed on migrant bodies in its intersection with the regimes of borderization enacted across the space of the sea. Bembe tells us in his watershed essay, Necropolitics, that, I quote, the ultimate expression of sovereignty largely resides in the power and capacity to dictate who is able to live and who must die, to kill or to let live. This constitutes sovereignty's limits, its principal attributes. To be sovereign is to exert one's control over mortality and to define life as the deployment and manifestation of power. 
The border then becomes one of the most acute manifestations of that power that lies entirely in the division it lays out between classes of humanity on the basis of uneven conceptions of worth in a commodification of human life through the dual paradigm of productivity and waste that find its root in um, the differential logic of capitalism and empire. This divide is set between those within the purview of the law, the community or demos, the political body producing sovereignty on the one hand, and on the other hand, these outside the purview of the law. Those living in a state of exception, the one read by the crisis narrative, a total suspension, uh, sorry, temporal suspension, um, temporary suspension of the state's law, which in the ongoing time frame of crisis ceases to be temporary to reach long-term status. Those subjects are divested from political autonomy and dwell in the interstices of the state's welfare model. Those migrants are the target of a matrix of policies that gear toward containment and partitioning. Some of them are kept offshore in refugee detention camps in third countries, as we've discussed, caught in the web of spatial violence, humanitarian strategies, and a peculiar biopolitics of punishment, in Bambi's words, these migrants fall prey to a carceral logic in which people deemed surplus, unwanted, or illegal are governed through abdication of any kind of responsibility for their lives and welfare. Borders, Bembe tells us, everything begins with them and all paths lead back to them. This commonality of condition harkens back to Neimani's reflection on the common wateriness of all human bodies to their connection back to a planetary, originary amniotic fluid. Through a, necro a necropolitical lens, however, Nimani's hydro comments take on darker hues as the only shared condition to which this possessed subject can aspire with regards to water is one marked by death and dis dissolution. As the odds of perishing at sea have risen from one in 42 in 2017 to one in 18 in 2018, the borderization of the sea therefore heralds the confiscation of universal inalienable human rights for migrants. Even those who make it to the other shore are contained, enclosed in detention camps, many of which only provide scant necessities for a life reduced to its most essential expression. The humanitarian logic of the camp rests on what Fabienne Brugère and Guillaume Leblanc have called the principle of succou, of rescue, in opposition to the principle of welcoming, welcome, accueil, giving the means to live a decent life. In other words, it is an aspiration to let live rather than to make live in any meaningful way, way that lies at the heart of this regimentation of humanity into a class of surplus and desirables and a class of citizens benefiting from the protection and welfare of a democratic, democratic nation. So it is in this perspective that I would like to consider the dissolving bodies of drowned migrants through the lens of an overarching principle of bearing bodies. And I'm here referring to George Agamben's concept of bare life bearing here taken as the ultimate implementation of a logic of disappropriation. Bearing migrants' bodies means to profoundly dehumanize them, to demote them from the realm of subjecthood to that of objecthood. This objectification pertains to the logic of invisibility inflicted on migrants, either falling apart in their country of origin, dissolved in the maritime abyss, or succumbing to the invisibility of a life of clandestinity, migrants are always already on the verge of disaggregation. The spectral lives they embark on when setting out on their journeys partake on the creation of what Mbembe has called death worlds that purview new and unique forms of social existence in which, in which vast population, oops, sorry, uh, vast populations are subjecting to living, subjected to living conditions that confer upon them the status of the living dead. The human animal assemblages features in Alami's novel thus reflect the same dehumanizing impulse, animating nationalistic views of migration as a pathological perversion of the supposed normality of national belonging. The disappearance of bodies at sea mirrors their disappearance on the edge of Europe, in the non-space of the detention camp on the outer limit of state-sponsored systems of recognition and accountability, migrants are derealized, they turn specters. The dissolutive ontologies that we have identified in the maritime context are therefore not an anomaly, not a glitch in Europe's benevolent asylum granting system. They are not the antithesis of a supposed politics of welcome that has taken room, root on the other side of the sea. The amalgamation of bodies and border, the relegation of bodies to the boundaries imposed on them via borderization, in fact, constitute the very essence of the supposed hospitality granted to refugees by European states. 
The becoming sea of drowning migrants, therefore, is only a hyperbolic materialist version of the social and ontological annihilation of migrants denied the right to existence beyond the threshold of the border. It puts a magnifying glass over the refusal to see migrants in their distinct humanity as individual subject, humans deserving of a full life. In the space of the border, as in the space of the sea, the migrants undergo a becoming border of the self, a dissolution into the border space dam into its regime of negativity. What this dynamic highlights is the migrants' condition as residue, and I will finish with this. They are the waste produced through labor selection processes. Migrants are residual insofar as they fail to enter the space line beyond the border. They are forever dwelling in this non-space of disappropriation, these dead spaces of non-connection, which deny the very idea of a shared humanity and linked to the ephemerality of our common condition. But I want to believe that there is another meaning also to this residuality, one going beyond disappearance and alienation, one maybe more subversive, and I'll finish with this concept of the residual as that which exceeds the logic of obliteration itself. What remains behind, what haunts it, perhaps not only the migrant disintegrating into the sea, but something closer to the stubborn grain of sand thwarting the smooth running of the machine, maybe then the residue that will eventually stall its progress. Thank you very much.